Welcome to this session, which Thrive is delighted to be presenting as part of this year's Imagine Belfast Festival. It is particularly good to be part of Imagine Belfast, as Pete, the director of the festival, and Richard from Accidental Theatre, who are helping to film this session, were two of our partners in the Changing the Game project. So this feels like very much the right place to talk not just about the project, but also the story of what led us to the project and where we might go from here. I also am joined today by Professor Paul Moore, Director of Future Screen NI, one of a number of creative clusters across the UK that are creating and developing opportunities for job, job creation, investment and skills development in a range of technologies across the creative industries. Future Screen NI funded the Changing the Game project and so it's really great to have him here to participate in today's events. My name is Margaret Henry and I work for Thrive Audience Development. We're a cultural organisation and we help other cultural organisations to build relationships with the public. Through communications, respect and trust, we help arts, heritage and cultural organisations to ensure that what they're doing meets the needs of the public and ultimately derives the best public benefit. Today, I want to reflect a bit on how COVID-19 has changed people's lives. And we've been hearing a lot about that in Imagine Belfast. And what that means for cultural organizations, for artists, for creatives, and also for the public, who, as we know, in many different ways, engage with arts and culture. We then turned our reflections into a framework for cultural organisations to use for greater public benefit as we move through and hopefully out of COVID. And I want to tell you a bit more about that today. Before I get into it, I want to let you know that if you're watching this live on Monday the 22nd of March at three o'clock, you can take part in our live Twitter chat. Simply ask us a question on Twitter and use the hashtag CTGimagine and we will come back to you. If you're watching this at another time, however, you can still tweet us, and I promise we'll get back to you as soon as possible. So what did we know about arts and culture before the pandemic? Well, we knew quite a bit. We knew that people from many different backgrounds, age groups, and locations across Northern Ireland either participated in or attended a vast range of arts, culture, and heritage activity, from reading to crafting, from going to concerts to attending plays, and lots and lots of other stuff too. We knew this in Thrive because we've carried out a number of research studies over the last four to five years, which has shown that there is a high level of engagement in culture, and that a lot of that is because people recognize the many benefits that can be had from either participating in or attending the cultural activity on offer across Northern Ireland. But we also knew that it's not a one size fits all. What people actually did in their cultural activity, where they did it, how often they did it, was of course influenced by their lives, their age, their background, where they were living, a whole range of factors. And those influences changed as you move through your own life stages. We also knew that people were still encountering barriers to taking part in arts, culture and heritage. And in the jargon, we often talk about people being hard to reach. And that's not a phrase that we in Thrive really uh, enjoy. The truth is, is that in the arts and cultural sector, we want to be able to be as accessible to as many different people as possible. And in order to do that, we need to understand what everyone's needs are so that we can adapt what we do to meet those needs and remove those barriers to engagement. We know, for example, that older people sometimes felt that they couldn't engage in arts and culture due to the fact that maybe they didn't like going out at night. We know that people within the deaf disabled community had real issues about being able to access some of what was on offer across Northern Ireland. And we also knew that arts and cultural organisations were working very hard to break those barriers down. 
So lots of good work happening before the pandemic, lots of engagement, lots of different motivations as to why people were engaging with arts and culture. And then COVID-19 happened. A global health pandemic, as we know. We were all plunged in this time last year to our first lockdown, working from home, homeschooling, and a huge amount of uncertainty. As we know, 12 months on, we're still living with the pandemic and trying to work out how we meet the challenges that it has thrown up. We know that a lot of our cultural venues that closed 12 months ago have remained closed. We also know that many cultural organizations have done fantastic work at adapting. So what happened 12 months ago? Well, to give us a little bit of a flavor of that, I want to bring in Pete, who is the director of the Imagine Belfast Festival. Um, Pete, 12 months ago, you were about to set sail with Imagine Belfast 2020 and, the co and COVID was launched mm -hmm. upon us. What were you feeling? What were you thinking? Well, yeah, two weeks to go, basically, before the start of a 92 event program and suddenly the world changed and uh, we either had that either we were going to close and disappoint all our speakers and performers you know who had prepared for their events or we decided well let's take the risk and let's jump into this virtual world and see if we can rescue elements of the program mm -hmm. and we very quickly pivoted and managed to persuade 52 event organizers to come with us 52 speakers and performers and perhaps quite surprisingly, the more experienced, um, the more, how can I say, people who've been around perhaps the longest in the industry, they were actually the more difficult to persuade to go with us on this journey. It was the more, how can I say, younger performers, you know, people who were perhaps nimbler or less to lose, arguably, who came with us. And uh, I think it's to their credit that we we're able to put out, you know, that, that type of program. And we were the first, if you like, virtual festival in Northern Ireland to be able to, to run such an extensive okay. program. And you obviously had that responsibility to your performers, to the people you'd engage with, to your funders indeed, and your investors. Mm. What about your responsibility to your audiences? Did you feel that? Yes, uh -huh. and um, we did engage with our audiences and we actually added new events. We were able to fill okay. out the program, particularly to interrogate what COVID meant. Um, so that was really important, I think, to get that sense from our audiences, people who, you know, we've been going for seven years, so we've built up quite a, well, we see it as family, you know, um, a real cohort of people who, who really value what we do. Mm -hmm. So they were, in a sense, were able to suggest events, you know, they would be particularly interested in. Um, and of course, what we found was that we were able to generate brand new audiences, particularly internationally, but also from younger people. Mm. And the point that you made in your introduction about older people, you know, we, we got fantastic feedback from disabled people who could physically never come to our events, but they really valued yeah. the fact that they're able to, to consume our online content. Yeah, yeah. So, as Peter said, they're uh, finding out about audiences and how they were feeling as they were moving through COVID was really a big project for Thrive as well. And we undertook a range of pieces of research over the last 12 months. And we were finding out, and it wasn't a big shock, that people were missing live events. That buzz of being in the same room as actors, musicians, plus just getting out of the house to do something. There was no huge shocks in that. But it was useful to really see that writ large in our research. Um, it was important to know that people were missing the cultural stuff that they had been able to do before COVID and that they really were saying that they were missing out on those benefits. Even in those early days, I think we all thought that maybe by September we would be back on track again um, and that audiences would return as long as they were kind of confident that there were some safety measures in place. Importantly, we heard loud and clear from audiences that they wanted communications from their cultural organizations. Pete refers to family there. And I have to say there is a real bond between people and the cultural organizations that they engage with. There is a special relationship and they wanted to know how those cultural organizations were coping during lockdown. 
what plans they were hatching and how their staff and volunteers were getting on with this really challenging new environment. We saw as well, as Pete has referenced, the opening up of many opportunities. Suddenly you could access opera from the Met in New York and you didn't have to pay the prices, never mind do the travel. We were starting to see that increase of people doing cultural stuff online, enjoying that activity that they couldn't have access to before. We saw a huge increase in box sets and films being uh, consumed. The success of Schitt's Creek alone, which I think we have to put down to uh, Netflix, um, I think is one shining example of how that's worked. People were enjoying spending time with their kids and getting out more because back then the weather was really good. We saw um, Anesta undertook an, a lot of research around this increase in consumption of culture online. So they were telling us that people were definitely embracing this online participation, whether it was streaming TV and films or whether it was indeed creating content themselves. And participation was rising, particularly among those aged 55 and above. So really seeing some of those audiences that maybe before had experienced the barriers, now experiencing some new opportunities. And there's no doubt, even in those early days, lockdown accelerated the adoption of things like online TV and film streaming, and particularly by older audiences. We saw similar trends in Northern Ireland. By the time we did our next wave of research in June and July, 55% of people were engaging in culture here. 34% of those started doing it since lockdown, which was great to see that uptake. 24% were taking part in creative activities online, whether that was an online art class, or a choir rehearsal. And 22% were attending an online arts or music festival, some of which I'm sure may have been imagined Belfast. Audiences were consuming content from local, wider UK, Republic of Ireland, and international cultural providers, again opening up a world of opportunity, but also a crowded marketplace. All of this that we were seeing in Northern Ireland made sense with the wider trends we were seeing across the UK and beyond. We also knew that arts and cultural organisations in Northern Ireland were, as they were everywhere, adapting, as the Imagine uh, Festival did, to provide content for people who were continuing to be at home and having to deal with all of that. There are many examples of how arts and cultural organisations in Northern Ireland have pivoted. Um, we've seen Big Telly, creating um, their Zoom Tempest, and that was back in April, and they were one of the first off the mark. The Foil Film Festival came back online in 2020, offering premieres for new international and local films, which hadn't been available anywhere else. So really making a unique offer, even up against the big guys like Netflix. And we saw Seacourt Print Workshop, based in Bangor, but creating a printmaking workshop online and sending out boxes with additional materials, even biscuits and thank you notes to those who registered to take part. Innovation was definitely there. We know that there was a brief reopening for museums and galleries, but we had another lockdown and then that further intensified towards the end of the year. But people's lives were really changing the impacts were becoming deeper. People were missing live events. They were suffering from screen fatigue. They were missing social connection. They were finding homes homeschooling a struggle. And there's no doubt that there was mental health impacts. But there was also those opportunities that were increasingly emerging as to what Culture Online could do and how it could be open up to different groups. That was when we started to talk to our partners at Imagine Belfast and Accidental Theatre about developing a framework. A framework that would help arts and cultural organisations to really benefit from those opportunities and how they were opening up as we moved through lockdown. So to talk a bit about that, I'd like to introduce you again to Professor Paul Moore from Future Screen NI, who was really looking at all the, this change as well and how they could respond. So Paul, you created the Rewriting the Narrative initiative. Uh, why was it important for you to do that on Future Screen? 
and then why was changing the game lucky enough to be one of the projects you chose to support? Well, first of all, I'd like to say I'm absolutely delighted to be here. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you for the offer and to thank Imagine Belfast and the Accidental Theatre. Just to get an opportunity to put it in context and to be associated with the work. I think when we looked at this, we, we made two decisions very quickly. One was that we didn't think it was going to go away very quickly. Now, we're not looking around corners or anything, but we kind of looked at it and said, what if it doesn't go away very quickly? How can we get in quickly to try and sustain the partnerships we've made and try and create a network to try and keep that together, which we push in a, an event we have every week called Future Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. We also saw it as an opportunity in the sense that our brief is to develop a creative industries, create jobs, increase gross value added, and where possible, um, create new jobs and create new businesses. And because of the quality of the creative industries within Belfast, and I don't say that lightly, and because of the willingness for those businesses to engage with us, mm. that piece was ongoing. Mm. The other brief we had was to make social and cultural difference mm. and to create a dividend there. And that's much harder. And we saw this as an opportunity right away to try and step in there and say to people, OK, how can you do what you're doing or do something new, but do it under COVID circumstances? Sure. And so we offered an award of £5,000, very relatively small sum of money, mm -hmm. to people who could come forward with an idea of how to work under COVID or some new way of working under the COVID regulations. We offered 20. We ended up doing 32 mm -hmm. because there was so much demand and because of the quality that was there. And I'd have to thank the Arts and Humanities Research Council, who are our bosses in a sense, because they went with us. Many of the projects were out of scope sure. because they weren't about film and broadcast or they weren't about VR and AR or whatever, but they were within scope in shifting the creative industries in the public imagination because the creative industries will not sustain itself unless people know what we do, mm. unless we're visible. Mm. And it was really important also to get into rural areas mm. because the very point you're making about how the digital allows people to be in two places at the one time. Mm. And so they could... We could move into those rural areas that perhaps we weren't getting into as before. Mm. Changing the game when we looked at it, and it's important to say it was judged along with all the others, and I should mention we have a full team. Um, don't want to make it sound as though it was me making these decisions. Yeah. We have a management team who, who looked at this and made these decisions. Um, and we, they were all assessed blindly by the six members of the management team. And what was really important about changing the game was, A, you had huge knowledge already, mm. which you were bringing and presenting as part of a process to take that knowledge forward and do something else with it. Mm -hmm. And crucially, you were offering a template and a framework which will allow people to go forward and to have a framework mm. to build this new space in. And, and for us, the crucial part about that is, and I know you're going to talk about it, I don't want to jump the gun, but the framework isn't a one-off because it's a circular process yeah. and you're creating a kind of creative industry virtual circle yeah. a virtuous circle whereby people can keep doing this at whatever stage they are in the process yeah. so for us it was an absolute it was actually important that we funded that work because we've had a little motto up until now about making the creative industries the new heavy industries in Belfast I think our last little piece our motto might become leave no one behind Yes, and I think brilliant. that's what you are allowing us to do in this framework to leave no one behind. Great, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Paul. So in Thrive, we began to work on the Changing the Game project, uh, but we very much worked in partnership, not only with Imagine Belfast and with Accidental Theatre, but we talked to a lot of those arts and cultural organisations working in all areas of the creative industries, some of whom I've already mentioned who had already been pivoting and adapting their work, some of whom were trying to work out what the next best steps were. We're now going to talk you briefly through the framework. If you want to know more, please get in touch with us at Thrive. We'd be more than happy to help. If you just uh, go to our website or give us a shout, we will certainly um, talk you through it in more depth. But just to give you a flavour and an overview of that kind of cycle, I'm going to now talk to Moran. Moran's part of the team at Thrive, um, and Moran was very much leading on uh, the Changing the Game project from Thrive's point of view. So, Moran, tell us a bit about the Changing the Game framework. Yes. So, how did we create this framework? 
Um, it was a mix of desk research. Uh, we surveyed 13 local cultural organizations all around Northern Ireland, and we also did followed up interviews with them. So, as we said here, although the framework is really aimed at cultural organizations, we like its design and its elements were very much thought of with the benefit of the general public in mind. Um, so the framework starts, the first step is define your goals. It's really important to remember the context last year, whenever organizations had to close their venues and they had to cancel all their performances. Uh, they didn't have the time to think uh, of a strategy or think why they were doing whatever they were doing. They, it was just an immediate response in survival mode of we have to create something and make something happen. And this is why we're starting with this first step, uh, because you have to sit back and think about why you're doing things. Uh, at Thrive, whenever we start a new project, we always, we always ask ourselves, uh, why are we doing it? What are we trying to achieve? And is it in line with our purpose? And we really believe that digital shouldn't be the starting point of why you're doing something, and it's just a mean to an end. Uh, then the second step is focus on research. Uh, that's the most important step, we believe, at Thrive, because we're all about research. Um, everything you will do will be based on that. Uh, it will be que questions like, who is this for? What platform does this audience use? What do they like? What do they not like? Um, and as Margaret mentioned, we did a lot of research uh, last year, uh, audience surveys. And we know that people's lives change all the time. Uh, for example, last summer, 55% of people were engaging with culture online. But we also know that by November, only 50% were engaging with culture online. And we also know people engage more with passive content rather than interactive content. So those are the type of insights that we think are really important whenever you want to plan your strategy. Uh, so then comes a third step, which is the time to plan your strategy. And all the organizations we surveyed and interviews all had the same tips, which were uh, don't be afraid to experiment. Uh, always ask for help if you need it, uh, because there are other people out there, like Accidental, who have the equipment and they know how to use it. So ask people around you to help you. And also, it doesn't have to be perfect right away. Like, it's okay to test and try, and being clumsy is a really good thing. Then comes the time to go live. So we think it's really important to monitor your performance as you go along and also to take notes of all the changes you want to make in the future, um, which takes us to the final step, which is evaluation, which is when you sit back, relax, and <laughs> um, look at what you've done. It's when you ask your audience for feedback, uh, you look at what you did well and what you didn't do as well and what are the changes you want to make afterwards whenever you start again. Um, so I guess to sum up, our final step would be uh, don't just take up things online without research and planning. Uh, reach, out to, reach out to others who, don't, who have the skills you don't have. Like I said, you don't have to buy new fancy equipment. Uh, and finally, again, being clumsy is a really good thing. <laughs> uh, so we're very grateful that organizations took part in that research and project. Also really grateful of the partnership with Imagine and Accidental. And thank you to Future Screens for the funding as well. And hopefully cultural organization will think, will use this framework and think it is really useful to them at whichever step they are and their journey to digital. Thanks. Thanks, Moran. Um, so it might all sound deceptively simple, but for those of you that have been through it and have adapted, it's not. Um, it takes a lot of work. And I'm going to come back to Pete now. So Pete, we talked about last Imagine Belfast 2020. Now we have Imagine Belfast 2021. So how did you change your game over the last 12 months? 
Well, a lot happens in a year, and we've all been through so much. Um, but I suppose, you know, as an organization, we it, it emboldened us, really. You know, the experience basically taught us to be brave and to experiment more and to pick up on Moran's point. You know, at the end of the day, I suppose our festival is lucky in, in that, you know, it's mostly talks and debates and stuff, so we can move online, you know, quite easily compared to, say, music or, say, comedy-driven events. And I always feel sorry for comedians, you know, who miss mm. that interaction with audiences um, and certainly you know we will go back you know to live work you know we love that physical interaction with audiences but um, we learned a lot about being able to reach out you know to build international alliances to bring on board new partners and to start communicating with a very different audience um, and that also fed into our programming that we were able to bring on board you know a more ambitious if you like set of um, range of content so we people like Noam Chomsky for example who you know we would never physically get to Belfast I'm sure he'd love to come but you know he's 92 yeah. for heaven's sake so being able to bring him into the program and to you know just to be more adventurous um, you know I think that was perhaps the, the biggest learning point really mm. Um, mm. life is short so as a, as a cultural organization we thought we would go for it yeah no and it, it feels very much like the acceleration, everything that's happened over the last 12 months, you know, it's not going to go back. Uh, the genie's kind of out of the bottle now. Sure. And we have all done our best to embrace mm -hmm. it uh, and to, to adapt what we do within the sector. So, but the positives have outweighed a lot of the negatives in terms of being able to reach out there to different audiences and different people. Totally, and uh, like we would probably adopt, you know, a hybrid, if you like, model, you know, where we'll have physical physical events, but we'll record and we'll broadcast them and archive them, you know, for future reference. Um, and again, we're probably lucky in the sense that most of our events, in fact, ninety nine point nine percent, are free. So again, that model, you know, lends itself, you know, to a webcast and if you like format. Mm. Um, and because there's just such a momentous time in our history people are interested in engaging and big ideas and looking to the future and so again it was very opportune in a sense for a festival like us to grab the zeitgeist you know be yeah. part of this momentous time in, in history great thank you so where are we now um people talk about another cultural renaissance as we had after um the previous world wars but it feels like this cultural renaissance might be a bit different. Um, maybe it'll be less about he hedonism and more about fairness and opportunity. We know that people's lives have changed. That means what they need and the role of arts, culture, the creative industries in those lives has also changed. People are talking about the experiences they want to have again or anew once the lockdown is lifted. Is it about indoor, outdoor, or online? Maybe that's not exactly the important thing. The important thing is how the arts and cultural sector understand what people need and create the experiences that meet those needs. Yes, that's what it said before COVID too. It was all about understanding people and their needs. But COVID has changed what some of those needs might be. We've absolutely seen arts and culture open up to many different groups, as we've already referenced. We've also still seen that exclusion can still exist. And we know, for example, in Northern Ireland, as there is in other parts of the UK, there still is a real challenge around digital poverty. Not everyone in Northern Ireland has access to the kind of broadband that they would like to have to be able to participate in arts and culture online. So there's still some big nuts to crack. But we're all trying now to work together, having seen the benefits and the opportunities that are on offer. And all of this does take working together. Arts organisations, the brilliant creative industries, uh, or organizations that we have across Northern Ireland, those creative individuals, people who are prepared to take a risk, be clumsy and see what happens. We need funders involved, we need government involved, we need our local authorities. 
we also need the public. And I know that in many uh, of the Imagine Belfast events, there is a real feeling that in order to build back better after COVID, we need to be getting involved at the grassroots level as well as a strategic level. We all need to talk, listen and understand each other. It's not easy. It's not easy for the arts and cultural sector. There are many, many collective and individual challenges. And it's not easy for all of us. As human beings, we're facing a really difficult time now as we try to make our way through and out of COVID. But we know that opportunities exist. Today, I would ask you all to speak up. Get involved in what cultural activity looks like in your area in your life. How those spaces, be they indoor, outdoor and online, are used for the benefit of you, your families, your communities. And for cultural organisations to ask those audiences to listen and to get them involved as well. So as we come to the end of the session, I'd like to thank Pete, Moran and Paul for joining us today. I'd like to reiterate our thanks to everybody who took part in the development of Changing the Game. It is a living, breathing project, so please get in touch if you wanted to talk more. So there's no doubt the game has changed. Let's hope that the game now will be one that everybody can play. Thank you. <laughs>